You know, I want to talk about this Arizona law that you, that you mentioned earlier. It's obviously like a major development. Before we go there, I just want to touch a little bit on you know this past administration. You actually quit following January 6th. Um, you said that President Trump had crossed a red line. I want to give you a chance just to kind of say your piece, like wh what exactly happened so people understand what your position was very clearly before we continue. Well, uh, to put it a little more in context, following the election in November, um, during the rest of November and December, when the there was debate happening around a second COVID relief package, there was a very real opportunity to get a school choice education freedom provision included in that bill. But the, the White House was not focused on doing those kinds of things and advocating for that kind of policy. And so what could have been wasn't. And my my role, my job focusing on doing the right things and everything we could for students, um, I had I'd pretty much come to the end of what we could possibly accomplish. And on January 6, when I saw what was happening and uh, I didn't hear the president say the things that he could have or should have said, at least what I felt, to put an end to what was happening. Um, and when he turned his back on his vice president, it was it was a kind of a, a line in the sand for me. I also felt we should have been taking victory laps about all of the accomplishments of the administration, of which there were so many. And instead, we were focused on, on this. And so I'm, I'm always a forward-looking person. That's what I continue to do, and that's what I think we need to do. Uh, it, look ahead. Let's learn from what we did in the past, but let's keep uh, moving forward and uh, doing the right thing for, in, in my case, the right thing for kids and, more broadly, the right thing for Americans. So, you know, you again, you started talking about this Arizona law. A number of people are saying this is groundbreaking. There's been nothing like this before. So. You know, tell me a bit about this law. Do you see this as the future for the American child, um, and and where should it go from here? Yes. So the uh, education savings account is what Arizona just passed, and and Governor Ducey signed into law. That means that for all 1.1 million students in Arizona, if their families decide that the school to which they're assigned is not working for them, they can take 90 percent of what the state would spend on that child and use it to buy that child's education. They could use it to go to a different school, one that requires tuition, a faith-based school or another private school of some sort, or they could use it to customize their child's education and uh, maybe buy a couple of classes at one place, maybe buy a virtual class, um, maybe a, you know, a couple of classes at a charter school, let's say, uh, any combination of, the, of those things, or perhaps some things that haven't yet even been developed. In Arizona, during the lockdowns, there were many families, uh, many of them in the urban areas, that started to band together in small cadres or con consortiums of families and, and basically start up what I would refer to as a 21st century one-room schoolhouse with multi-age kids. Um, they would hire a teacher that was looking for a different experience. And uh, for them, that's if that's working, they need to have the opportunity to continue to pursue that that kind of experience for their children. And, and like I said, the, the, uh, the system is, has been so one size fits all for uh, 175 years. We haven't really wrapped our heads around what education in the K-12 years could really look like for kids because we haven't had the kind of creativity that we've seen in every other industry. This in Arizona, and I think there will be other states that will soon follow, we're going to see that creativity really uh, fostered and growing in ways that we haven't even, we can't predict today. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash free trial yon. That's ept.ms slash free trial J-A-N. So you're just making me think of something bizarre that I heard fairly recently. Um, uh, basically, in a school where uh, all the teachers were not in school, right? this is in New York, basically, right? One of the moms is, is describing this situation. 
um, the parents banded together and created one of these schoolhouses in that same school. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, how bizarre an experience was that? Like the teachers couldn't come and they were actually, some of these teachers were somehow involved in the creation of this as well. So on the one hand, the actual system wasn't really functioning except perhaps virtually, although, you know, not certainly not at 100%. And on the other hand, there were people creating these sorts of things, in some cases even employing people that were involved in the educational system in the first place. What do you make of this? Well. I think it, it's just one example of people finding solutions to problems. And uh, I've used the example recently of a small school that I'm familiar with in West Michigan. I live in Michigan. Uh, it's cold in the winter in Michigan. And yet there's this small school where the kids are outside all day, all year long, and they're learning outside. And they choose to do this. It is an outdoor school by design. And the teachers who are there are choosing to be there. And I use it as one small example of thinking about solutions that we need to be much more open to. Because we know kids learn differently. They have different needs. And parents, again, have had front row seats to that in the last couple of years. And they've seen if distance learning was just the ticket for their child or if it was a disaster. They've seen. Uh, in many cases curriculums that they didn't want their children to be exposed to. And in other cases they've seen uh, curriculums that were very low in their expectations of what a child could do and their, the, you know, the parents may know that their child is capable of much more. They should have the opportunity to find the solution that's going to work for that child to unlock that child's full potential. For all intents and purposes, from everyone that I've heard, uh, the distance learning didn't work for most kids. It worked for a few kids that were very self-directed, but it didn't work for most of them. And I guess I, the, the other part of the, the, the previous question, you know, there's just, these teachers weren't, weren't in school, right? And so th this is one of the reasons the parents start, had to start organizing. But what about the fact that these teachers weren't in school in the first place? There's a lot of contention well, about that, right? And, and I think uh, many of them had longed to be in school. They knew that they were that their kids were falling further and further behind. Uh, but the system, in many cases, precluded them from doing that. There were a lot of teachers who I think have walked away from teaching because they've become so frustrated by the system. And in an education freedom environment like Arizona is just creating, teachers are going to become the most valued part of that equation. And there are going to be opportunities for them like they've never seen before. Opportunities for them to be really creative themselves about solving problems for families and kids uh, or addressing needs. And, I, and I'm just very excited about what it can mean for students in Arizona and, and more broadly, how it's going to continue to drive change. Because we know that this is a, a, a very um, winning issue for families, for everyone across, like four, uh, three out of four Americans say money for students should follow the student to where that student goes to school. That, you cannot deny the power behind that sentiment. And when that will act, when that actually happens at a scale to really make a difference, again, we're going to see creativity and experiences for kids in their K-12 learning that we haven't even begun to dream of because we're just so stuck in this one-size-fits-all old model that, uh, that is no longer working for way too many kids across the country. You're expecting, because of this new legal structure around the funding for, for students, all sorts of new models will spring up, teachers will be able to enter them, figure new things out. That's it's sort of like this innovation land in education. A absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, Florida is one state where they're farthest along with the most, the greatest number of students. They're going to continue to expand those opportunities for kids. We're only at the tip of the iceberg as to what that could look like. <laughs>